Uh, okay. So, uh, cycles. Um, so, um, cycles is a, a new render engine, and um, I'm just going to do. Uh, First, I'm going to talk about the design and, and uh, mostly on the user interface side. Uh, then I'm going to do a, a demo. I'll also show some some uh, some stuff during the design uh, part, and um, then I'll talk about plans for the future and things that we plan to implement and when uh, when when we will implement them. Uh, so, uh, Cycles is a is a new render engine. Um, and uh, I started working on this in my free time uh, after I quit my temporary job for well, a, a job which I had for a short while. I had, had a lot of free time, and you know, I was thinking about uh, just how would I design my ideal render engine because I, I, I had worked on, on on Blender internal and and also was quite you know was, of course quite familiar with the other render engines, but. I thought you know maybe I can I can do better. Um, of course, starting a new render engine you know when there are already so many is of course sometimes a bit questionable. But I, I just started because I just uh, thought I thought it would be fun to do. Um, so basically, the, the the goals that I had in mind was was a it had to be interactive. Um, you know you had you have to be able to see. Things updating as you change them, and this doesn't mean it has to be real time or you know really fast necessarily. Although that's nice, it just just uh, with Blender internal um, on the Open Movie projects, uh, it was was uh, really clear that you know there's a, there's a long there's a long time between you know just making a change and then pressing render and then waiting for the shadow buffers and you know building ray tracing acceleration structures and, and all kinds of pre-processing things. And it's it's just no fun to work that way. And uh, so one of the, one one of the things was just to make it interactive and just sort of keep going uh, while while you change your settings. The other is that uh, I want it to be easy to use. Um, in that uh, you know we have few parameters, uh, a few things that you have to tweak. You just sort of think about how you want it to look. And then it, it renders it for you. And then maybe, of course, if you want to do uh, want to sp speed up the rendering or or, uh, or you know do all kinds of tricks, you can still just do more advanced things. But you know, just the, the simple stuff should be simple, and and the, the 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 more complex stuff should take a bit more work, but should also be possible. So I also want to add like production features, not just have it like a just a physically based render engine, which which doesn't necessarily support things like render layers and render passes. So uh, those kinds of things I wanted to have in there as well. And uh, sort of the second thing is that this is being integrated as an external render engine. So um, I'm also improving the, the API for inter integrating external render engines. And uh, other engines should be able to benefit from this as well. Um, so you know I, I've, uh, I've worked a bit uh, with some of the developers from other render engines, but I haven't had as much time as I would like to, but I hope to just keep working on that and, and improving it also for other render engines. Um, okay. So, the design. Um, I'll just, I mean, I can't get into every little part of it, but I'll just take sort of four topics. One is the interactivity. Uh, the other is uh, the shading node system. Further is just uh, the ray tracing and, and, and the algorithms related to that. And then further, there's the CPU and the GPU rendering kernel, which you know it works on, on both the CPU and the GPU. And so there's that, that brings with it some uh, some design issues. Uh, okay, so the interactivity. Um, so one of the things you notice is, is when you use it, it's it's doing progressive rendering. It's just it starts with a noisy image and then it gets cleaner as you as you keep rendering. Um, especially in the viewport, this is useful. You know, and if you press F12, then this might not be optimal or always useful. But uh, we might actually add a second non-progressive rendering mode. But 
in the viewport, this is really useful because you can sort of navigate and, 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 and see your changes quickly and then sort of see the noise disappear uh, later on. And then you can really quickly see what you're changing um, because if you have something like a render man, render engine, it's more difficult, although you can also do all kinds of tricks to make it more interactive. But it's really like built into the engine that it's, it's kind, of bit, kind of like a game engine a bit in that you can sort of change things and move things and it doesn't have to sort of start up again. Um, and you know, you can start the render engine in the viewport and it starts rendering and then you can start editing materials and lights and objects. Um, I'll just maybe show that quickly. What that means. Uh, okay, uh, maybe it was more interesting. This is a really simple scene. I don't have any GPU acceleration on this laptop, so it's it's not going to be as fast as uh, as it is in some of the demo videos. Um, I guess it's about ten times faster on the, on the GTX 460, which I have, and about twenty times faster on uh, on the newer NVIDIA card. So this is just CPU render. It just started rendering. Uh, this is a free Blender rig, which I found uh, somewhere. Um, I for, yeah, okay. Uh, and so you can see that uh, it's just started rendering, and you can just sort of change, you know, material color, and it keeps rendering. You can, you know, change direction. You can make it darker, lighter. You know, you can even uh, just put this back to one. Uh, you can move objects, you can add objects, or just yeah. Um, of course, if you have a, have a more complicated scene, you'll need a more powerful computer to have this really interactive, but uh, you know, or you know, a fast graphics card. But if if you have a simple scene, it's already, or just you're just editing like a single model, it's already really fun to just uh, you know to just start editing um, and just immediately see what's happening. For example, you can also change. Just as a rig, uh, you know, you can sort of move, and it just it, it updates without having to rebuild the entire uh, the entire acceleration structure for ray tracing. So, uh, so that's the the interactive part. Uh, okay. Um, okay, the shading nodes. Uh, this is a really Big part of the design is, is sort of the shading system, the way um, you define your materials and your world and your lights. Uh, it's it's basically completely node-based in that everything is a node. Uh, shaders, textures, or nodes. I guess mo most uh, rendering software, most uh, most graphics editing, so you know, 3D graphics software uses a node-based workflow, um, just because it's. You know, you can you can you can do a lot with it. You can just sort of fit different different render engines with it, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's really flexible, of course, for defining for defining all kinds of materials. The only problem with it is that it's it, node edit, node trees can get really complicated because you know if you have like uh, 50 nodes or whatever, it's it, it, it can be hard to just understand what's going on, and um, for that reason, there's sort of two interfaces to uh, to the nodes. One is just in the node editor, and the other is in the properties editor. And in the properties editor, it's sort of like a, a tree view of your nodes. You can see the, the the surface, the volume, and the displacement outputs, and uh, the you can sort of see like uh, going backwards which which nodes are connected to that. And um, this is really useful if you have like a simple material. Or if you're using like a, a group node, um, with a group node you can sort of group like a more complex uh, node setup into a group that you can reuse. And then I think uh, I sort of envisioned this as, as you're using, uh, you can sort of create more complex materials and then and put them into group nodes. And then when you're sort of uh, adding materials in your scene, you can use the preset group nodes and then just add some textures into it and, and, and your node setup doesn't have to be as complicated and you can all do that, you know, you can sort of do the, the complex node setup uh, in the node editor and then when you're just doing uh, tweaking and, 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 uh, and just adding materials in your scene, you can do it in the properties editor. Um, I'll just give a quick demonstration of what's going, how that works. So. Um, I'll start with, maybe just ungroup this for a moment to understand what's going on. Um, 
so this is your material output node, and um, the the three the three inputs are uh, are panels in the in the material panel, and you can sort of see the mix shader is it, is uh, connected here, and uh, it's sort of a tree view of, of all those nodes. Um, of course, it's 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 really you know it's it's hard to understand what's going on, but when it's when it's a group, it's it's it becomes easier to see you know just the, the, the parameters that um, that you want to set so this is like a plastic material and a pl material and it has like a few parameters and uh, you can add uh, add textures to it through, for, just by by uh, pressing the little button next to the to the into the value to the socket and um, and then it adds a node so it's sort of just a different view of the same thing and it's like you can you can pretty quickly edit your node setups this way. Um, uh, okay. Hope that's clear. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's uh, kind of different from Blender internal is that there's nodes not only for materials but also for lamps in the world, and um, they're basically the same nodes, the same textures, the same shaders uh, that are available for different uh, for, for all three of them. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, for the mate for materials, uh, it's it's the material nodes are still uh, have more uh, have more outputs. There's a, a surface shader, a volume shader, which isn't implemented yet, but um, there's already a developer working uh, on on this implementation of volume shader. And then there's also a displacement output. And um, what is a bit special about the displacement output is that uh, it's uh, intended to be used both for bump mapping and for displacement. And there's a system that is not entirely perfect yet, but it's being worked on where, you, where basically you can use um, displacement sort of on a lower poly mesh and it will displace. And on top of that, it will, um, it will do bump mapping. And you just have to set one, one displacement output and then it will do both displacement and bump mapping uh, together. Or you can only use displacement or only use bump mapping if you want. But uh, the idea is sort of that you, you can, uh, you only have to control one of them, and, and it will do both displacement and bump mapping at the same time. Uh, okay. Another thing is that it's sort of physically based, um, because when when people mean uh, talk about physically based, it's it 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 doesn't necessarily always mean that you know it's all the values are sort of physics textbook kind of units and and, and things like this, but. It's sort of in the direction of physically based, but not necessarily every value is sort of like a purely physically based. We also think, I also try to design it that it's just convenient, uh, not necessarily a physical unit is not necessarily convenient or it's not necessarily flexible to design, to, to, to have a certain node that's, that's physically based, you also want to have some, some things which are just tricks or, or which you can sort of combine in your own way, which doesn't not necessarily correspond to anything in physics, but uh, which are useful anyway. So basically, there's sort of three ways in which this is different from Blender internal, uh, where it's sort of more towards physically based. That A, the nodes just define like the appearance of the, uh, of the material or the world or the light. And so they, they, they don't specify like this is done with ray tracing or this is done with rasterization or uh, or this is with a shadow buffer. It's just sort of, it's separate from uh, from from that. You can sort of define the material, the, the appearance, and then next to that you might have some settings to control how it's rendered. But when you're defining the nodes, you only have to think about um, what it looks like, not how it's rendered. Uh, one example of this is, for example, in, in Blender internal, you have like C transparency and ray trace transparency, um, or you have uh, shadow buffers and you have like ray trace shadows, and they sort of have different settings, and you have to think about you know how with transparency, for example, like they, they don't always combine well set transparency and ray trace transparency, and it sort of it's it sort of makes it more complicated. Um, if you if you mix those things together, um, uh, the other the other thing is that 
that we have fewer parameters than, than the Blender material. Um, of course, you can sort of make your own material with, with nodes, but uh, one of the, but it's also just, there's, there's fewer parameters because there's no distinction between uh, direct lighting and indirect lighting. And what that means basically is that usually, uh, well, in the old, old render engines uh, tend to be focused on direct lighting because indirect lighting was too slow when they were designed. So you have like a distinction between uh, specular and, uh, and, and reflection and, uh, and glossy reflection. And, and you have to sort of tweak them separately, but actually in reality they're the same, same thing. Like your specular highlight is just a reflection of your light on your surface. And so in that sense, it's, it's simplified because they're just, there's just one glossy node which will do both the reflection and, uh, and specular highlights. Um, so so it's, it's a bit simpler uh, than, than Blender materials uh, in that sense. And further, um, it's quite well defined like in the engine itself, which physical units uh, things use. It's like this is in watts and this is in... Uh, in watts per square meter or whatever, but uh, in the interface it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it's it, it's exposed that way. We also try to sort of tweak the values sometimes so that they're in useful ranges or, or just just easier to tweak, uh, even if they're not necessarily corresponding to a physical unit. It's still uh, the final the way it sort of combines the materials is still physically correct. Um, Okay, the, the other thing about uh, the shading uh, system is that it's based on, uh, on closures. Um, the, this name used to be in the interface, but now it's just called shader. Um, or, you know, there's, you have now a node called mix shader instead of mix closure. And this idea is based on um, the design also of open shading language. Um, basically, it's what, it, what it is, is, is sort of a, a way to do uh, physically based rendering with uh, production tricks and, and node systems. Because there, it's, um, if you just sort of think of, of uh, uh, like a material and some of the physically based render engines, it's, more, it's a bit more rigid in that you have, uh, you have your BSDF and you have your transparency and you have uh, emission and there and but you can't sort of combine them in this in in the same way always uh, you can't uh, you can't easily you can't always easily mix like subsurface scattering with the BSDF or or just I mean uh, it's it, there's sort of distinct things and and the the idea of a closure is that all these effects like a BSDF or emission or transparent or background or subsurface scattering or whatever, they're all, um, they're all closures and, and you sort of uh, add them in, in your shading, shading system and it, just, it gathers all of those and then uh, it's up to the render engine to render them. Um, and basically you can, using that system, you can actually sort of mix and match those kind of concepts into a single node tree without being uh, sort of limited to, to what, you, what, what the developer thinks like a material should consist of. You can sort of mix them together how, uh, however you like. Um, and basically that has one, one big effect on the way uh, you, you define your node trees, which is that, um, as you can see, there's now, there's sort of a green socket, which is uh, the shader socket. And uh, basically what it means is that you know, the, the, the surface and the volume uh, inputs are, are shader sockets, and they're different than a color socket. They're not an actual color. They're sort of a description of how you might render the surface or the volume, but they don't actually compute a color yet. They just sort of tell to the render engine, um, this is like, this is a diffuse surface, or this is transparent, uh, or this is a holdout closure, or something like that. And, and um, yeah, that's that's basically what you have to keep in mind that they're not just colors, although you can sort of think of them as colors in most situations. The difference is just that you cannot actually uh, edit them. You cannot do like a color ramp or something on them because uh, that's not something the render engine would be able to render. Uh, okay. 
think that was maybe a bit confusing, but um, let's just move on. Uh, okay. Um, well, the render engine uses only ray tracing. There's no rasterization. It's just simple path tracing. Um, there's no photon mapping or anything like that. Um, and this is, of course, partially because it's, it's easier, but also because I think uh, we should try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, the more rendering engines, uh, the more rendering algorithms you add, um, the more complicated things become uh, in, you know, in terms of the artifacts that you have to think about that they might generate, that you might have to tweak quality parameters. Um, and it's also just patch tracing is really suitable for interactive rendering. And um, part of the reason to keep it simple is because, uh, well, the, the, it actually is, um, patch tracing actually works quite well uh, for, for animation rendering. Um, if you keep sort of your effects limited, if you want to do like a full, uh, very indirect light, where the light has to bounce around like 10 times before it actually reaches, uh, reaches your, your scene, then, then you'll, you'll, you're going to need something more complicated. But those kinds of things are, are uh, too, too difficult to do anyway for an animation. You have to do more tricks and you have to do more sort of uh, ways to just sort of limit the bounces to get um, uh, to get an animation to render fast. And so, for example, Arnold Render, which is used by, uh, by Sony Imageworks, is just pure pad tracing. They don't do anything more complicated. And uh, I think, I think this, this uh, might actually be sufficient for, for sort of the target that I'm aiming for, which is not necessarily like hyper-realistic renders like Lux Render, because, I mean, they, they do what they do quite well. And, and we can just integrate them into Blender. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so that's sort, of, that's sort of the idea, to keep it simple and to keep it flexible, what you can do. Um, so the weaknesses of the current render engine is basically that A, it cannot do detailed geometry well yet. There, it will be improved, but uh, not necessarily um, up, to the, up to the standard that you have in RenderMan. Um, again, that's, that's sort of a, a design choice that you have to make. You can make a render, man and render engine where you have more pre-processing, uh, uh, which is less interactive uh, in, in changing geometry and, and changing materials, etc. cetera. Um, and we're going to try to address this, that weakness as much as possible, but it's not intended to be a render man render engine for, for big studios, but it's intended to be like a render engine that you can use you know, as a single person or a small team, I guess, as, as the Blender Foundation goal was, um, just to, to do your scenes, which are not necessarily like a massive uh, battle scene or, or uh, with like a, a, a million characters in it, but you know, just the sort of t scenes that uh, you would typically render and you, you want to do those really well. Um, yeah, and the other thing that we don't do well is things like caustics, which again is, is something for the physically based render engines. Um, so we're sort of in between that, and I think there's, a, there's an interesting middle ground that there uh, where, we don't where we sort of keep things simple, but um, uh, you know, it's still very flexible, um, but we'll see uh, how it evolves. Uh, so, for ray tracing, we use a BVH tree, um, and we support object instancing. Uh, basically, the, the BVH tree means that we can do updates uh, very quickly. If we use something like a KD tree or some of the other acceleration structures, it would be harder to update it as you're moving around objects or if you're deforming meshes. So that's, um, and the other thing is that it seems to be uh, fashionable nowadays. Everyone is switching to it, and I, I think they have a good reason. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's what most like the, the, the new rendering research and, 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 and seems to be what, what a lot of render engines are using now. Um, okay. So one example of some production tricks that we can do with ray tracing, which you usually maybe associate with rasterization, is that um, 
actually in the shader you can sort of uh, get information about uh, you know the context in which you're being shaded like you can query like is this being uh, shaded for a shadow ray or is this being shaded for a reflection ray or a camera ray and uh, using that information you can do interesting things like uh, if you want to optimize your rendering and uh, you only want to do your really expensive, really detailed textures uh, when you're looking directly at it uh, from the camera on the surface. And then if you want to have like for indirect light balances, you might have a simplified shader. You know, that's just a single color or uh, a lower resolution texture or whatever. And um, what that, you know, that gives you the kind of flexibility to sort of optimize your render rendering uh, in all kinds of interesting ways. Um, I'll, I'll maybe show some examples of, of what you can do with that. Um, okay. So, um, okay. I'll just make this class for a moment. Okay, so uh, what you can see here is that it's we have a glass dog, and it's not actually casting transparent shadows on the ground. And the reason is that this is actually a caustic. And this is this is really expensive to render. And uh, but we can do we can do a trick where we basically say uh, if you're looking uh, right at it, um, well no, if you're computing the shadow ray, and just pretend this is transparent and that this doesn't have any refraction, that just the ray just passes straight too. But if you're you know, if you're looking at it, then 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 it's going to bend. Then you're going to sort of have the refraction in the glass. So I'll just make a mix shader. And then I'll add a uh, transparent shader. Let's copy the colors. And uh, here we're going to say is shadow ray. And basically what's going to happen now is that, I don't know if it's very, it's a bit washed out, I guess. So I'll, uh, I'll lower it a bit. So you, I don't know if you can see it well, but okay. You sort of, you have now a transparent shadow, which isn't actually really accurate, but it's sort of, you know, it's, 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 it might be okay for your particular scene. Um, and so that's that's just an oh, so that's just an example of what you can what you can do with uh, with that kind of uh, information. Now, usually, I mean, you would you would have this as a preset, probably. Um, you know, you'd have some sort of cheap transparent glass or something, and then you you'd be able to use that as a preset. Um, okay. Another thing that we can do is is, for example, ray visibility, which is that we can make an object only visible to certain rays. For example, we can we can go in and we can just make this uh, this head invisible to camera rays, or we can make it invisible to shadow rays, uh, and, uh, and and some others as well. But they won't have much effect in this scene. Um, okay, so there's all kinds of tricks possible, uh, and we'll add some more more ways to so just sort of. Uh, you know, to do those kinds of tricks to speed up rendering. Uh, <clears throat> okay. I have to start talking a bit faster. Um, okay, uh, so we support both <coughs> CPU and GPU rendering. Um, so there's basically a single render kernel and it's compiled for both the CPU and the GPU. Uh, uh, so it's, it, it makes it easier to, to just sort of develop like on a single, on a single kernel. Uh, as far as I know, most other, um, most other projects, uh, you know, tend to have like CPU and GPU, some duplicate code or, you know, just, uh, and so this is really sort of saying like we you know, all the core, all the core rendering code has to work for the CPU and the GPU. Um, so that's that's sort of something that really was from the beginning in design, and it's really difficult to to add that back onto an existing engine because 
you know, all your data structures might be laid out differently and they might not work on the GPU. So that was really important in, in, the, in, in developing the engine. Um, currently, GPU rendering uh, only works on recent NVIDIA cards using CUDA. I mean, there's, there is some OpenCL support, but the problem is that uh, actually it works on NVIDIA OpenCL as well, uh, but the problem is that sort of still trying to work out how to make it work on AMD. There's sort of a, sub, a subset of the render engine works uh, on OpenCL, but the drivers are incapable, or the compiler is incapable of running uh, a really big kernel with all the features. So as we, if, we, if we would um, limit the number of features, it would work. But uh, at the moment, it's just because of the number of features that it doesn't actually and the driver isn't actually able to compile it. And I don't think it's even like a graphics card limitation. I think it's just, it's just something they have to fix. They, they, they might be able to fix in their drivers and um, we're in contact with them, but you know, we're still working on that, trying to, um, trying to get, get, uh, get it compiling and, and working also on AMD cards or ATI cards. Um, I'll probably skip the demo for now because I already showed some stuff and then maybe if there's time I'll show some more stuff. Uh, okay, plans. Um, the intention is to merge this into trunk within the next one or two weeks. Actually, I wanted to do it before the conference, but you know, I didn't make it for some reason. <laughs> Just other things to do. Um, but it'll be, it'll be in trunk really soon, and then it'll be in 2.61 as an extra render engine that you can select from the top header that you'll be able to use uh, instead of Blender internal if you want. It's not, it's not going to immediately you know, replace Blender internal. That's, that's just not, I mean, that's, we're not even, even remotely close to that, and, and when, when it's sort of at the same feature level, we still have to you know, think about it and, and see if there's still much, you know, it's gonna take it's gonna take probably you know years before we even consider throwing out Blender internal if we, and if we do it you know it's it's not something we're going to do like from one day to the next. Um, okay, so Im the immediate things that I'll probably work on is just sort of UI and integration stuff. Um, it's things like improving the texture. Workflow, adding adding a better system for node presets, adding things like border render and things like some 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 basic stuff which isn't there yet. Um, you know, fixing bugs. Um, and I hope that you know when 2.61 is released, uh, we'll have most of those issues sorted out, and then um, we can start focusing on uh, performance and uh, new features. Okay, so. Um, Regarding performance improvements, of course, uh, there's a lot of people complaining it's slow because you know it's just unbiased patch tracing. It's just uh, if, if you have a certain scenes, it's just gonna converge really slowly. Um, and there's sort of three ways uh, in which we can optimize. One is just you know make make it faster. Uh, just make the ray tracing uh, faster. Make the shading faster. Uh, we can, you know, probably improve that, you know, maybe twice as fast, three times as fast. I don't know. This is hard to know what the upper bound is, but it's not, it's not going to make like a, a massive difference uh, by optimizing this. But we're going to work on that as well. The, the really, the really big difference comes from smarter uh, sampling, and um, uh, there's. There's basically, you know, you have to evaluate how many sp samples you spend on anti-aliasing, how many you spend on indirect light, how you sample your light, etc. And so there, we'll, we'll, we'll really try to focus on getting, um, just getting it to render as noise-free as possible in as, as, as little uh, samples as possible. Uh, and this is, uh, I guess this is the main, the main challenge uh, in making it fast enough for animations. Um, it doesn't necessarily need any any totally different algorithms. Um, it's just because you know Blender internal itself doesn't it doesn't use anything like bidirectional path tracing or photon mapping anyway. It's it, but it's it's uh, it's you know 
it's it's faster at rendering certain things. Um, okay, and the third thing is also that um, when you're comparing Blender uh, internal to Cycles, is that basically Cycles is rendering every possible light interaction by default. So um, you know, in Blender, when you start out, you basically have like your point light. Uh, you don't have ambient occlusion or, or anything like that enabled by default and you sort of enable one thing after the other uh, and then it gets slower as well but with cycles it's sort of the other way around it's sort of noisy by default if you um, if you just have everything enabled you have sort of ambient occlusion enabled well it's not ambient occlusion it's environment lighting but you have all those uh, all those things enabled by default and then you have to know how to disable things to make it faster and um, that's one of the areas where we have to work to make it, uh, to get some good presets for just, you know, direct lighting or just, just sort of limiting, um, limiting, limiting the, the light interactions that you render so that if you want to just do a simple direct lighting render or you want to just do like, just one bounce and, 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 and some reflections or whatever, then, then, then we just, then it should be possible also to render like a quick noise free image. Um, so that's, that's, one of the areas they will also work on, which is mostly actually a user interface issue. Um, okay. And then, uh, well, I mean, over, we'll also add, add features. Uh, there's, these are just some big features like render layers, passes, subsurface scattering, volume rendering, adaptive subdivision, all that kind of stuff. It's all really fun to add. Um, and, you know, we'll just sort of start working on this one by one. Um, I guess the, the most important for, for Mango uh, would be render layers, render passes, uh, and volume rendering, I guess, if you want explosions. Um, you know, maybe subsurface scattering, I don't know, that's not, that's not the hardest one. Um, we already have some code for, subsurface, uh, for uh, adaptive subdivision, um, so if we need that. We could also look into it. I mean, it will just sort of add feature, just uh, keep adding features uh, one by one over the next year and then um, see where we end up. Okay, questions? Yeah, I guess I'll take some questions now because we're running a little late anyway. So um, just start with some questions and if there's something you want me to demonstrate, I can, I can, uh, can try to demonstrate it. Uh, so, any questions? Yeah, on the back. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that you have one, uh, one kernel for both CPU and GPU uh, rendering. Uh, can you use both at the same time, or do you have to choose? Okay, I, uh, currently, it uses one or the other. Actually, there is actually a system to use both at the same time. It's in the code that just, it doesn't, uh, I have to make some tweaks, but it's basically almost there. The thing is, I don't think CPU plus GPU rendering isn't the most useful thing because usually one or the other is, is much faster. Like the, either your GPU is really fast or your CPU, or you have like a slower GPU. But um, I mean, it, it'll probably be added uh, as an option, but um, like the, the, the maximum speed up is, is twice as fast and usually it's not because one or the other is usually faster. But, uh, and I guess also related to that is multi-GPU rendering, and uh, we'll add that as well. The code for that is also almost there. I just don't have a, a computer yet with, with multiple GPUs to test it, but um, I'll get to it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not compatible at all, actually. Um, so it's not, it's not a preview render um, for the current render engine. And uh, I would say that, you know, um, I think, you know, it, it, it will be sort of in terms of performance for rendering like direct lighting or just like some basic ambient occlusion. I think it will be uh, pretty much 
uh, just as fast as the internal render engine for those kinds of things. So uh, it's 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 not it's not really usable as a preview render for another render engine because yeah it's a completely different shading system. Some other questions, yeah. Um, okay, in comparison to uh, well, um, well, Octane, uh, I, well, uh, compared to Octane, for example, I guess it's. I mean, it's 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 sort of it's quite similar in that it's uh, they're both just path tracers that work on the GPU. Um, this has a bit more sort of production features, or it's sort of a design that's that's going to. Include things like uh, like render layers and render passes, and and uh, you can do more more tricks with this. Um, I don't know actually which things were added in Octane over the last year or so, but um, I guess it's it, it it's uh, it's just a little a bit different design, uh, and it also works on the CPU, which last I checked Octane didn't. Compared to V-Ray. Uh, I don't know if V-Ray RT, I guess, exists, but I, I don't really know all the all the features. Um, the second question was... Oh, um, well, uh, okay, uh, there's basically two, I mean, there's sort of two, two kinds. One is just if you want, like, a render farm, and um, basically it should work uh, with a render farm because it's just calling, you know, rendering through the through Blender. Basically, any external render engine integrated into Blender should uh, basically work on an external render farm on a render farm. Um, then there's of course also maybe you want like view real time in the viewport distributed rendering. Um, and um, I did some tests with that, but it's also not not finished yet. But that would be kind of interesting to sort of have it real time also. I uh, use many CPUs in, in the network. Okay, uh, other questions? Yeah. Is there a plan to add all of the displays that you the computer sites? Well, okay. And the, the, the first, uh, it will not be micro polygon per se because that's sort of a, you know, we're not going to do like the render man architecture kind of thing. There will be adaptive subdivision um, so that, uh, you know, it it, uh, it just subdivides based on how close you are and that you get, like, the nice crisp displacements. It will not, at, at first, it will not, um, you know, it will use it will use more memory. It will actually use, keep the geometry in memory. And then um, at a later stage, uh, I also have some ideas to sort of try to reduce memory, swapping them in and out, and, and, and just keep the memory lower. But um, So there will be adaptive subdivision, which is already already helps a lot. And then after that, uh, at some point in the future, I'd like to look into do something similar. Uh, it wouldn't be micro polygon per se, but you know, so there's some render engines like Arnold, which also supports um, this kind of thing. And I, I think we can do it, um, yeah. More questions? Um, I mean, it would be possible to write a script like basically anyone should be able to do it now if they want to write a pro Python script. I think you can add nodes using Python. You can connect them so you can, you know, make it make maybe a group node or whatever that even that approximates Blender, and then, or you know, you, you could write a script. You can you can start doing it. Uh, anyone could start doing it if they wanted to. Uh, the other question: motion blur. Um, well. Uh, how well it, uh, I, 
there's, I mean, there's different kinds of motion blur even. So you have like camera motion blur, you have object motion blur, and then you have deformation motion blur. And I have ideas to, well, you know, for all of them to be implemented. Um, it's, I mean, I can talk about how, how, how I would implement them if you want, but it's, it's quite technical. Um, but, you know, for, cam for things like camera motion blur, object motion blur, it's sort of a, a matter of interpolating the transformations uh, and then, then intersecting sort of the interpolated thing. And I guess for triangles, it's sort of similar. You have like the triangle just further along and just the triangle back in time. And then you sort of interpolate between them or you might have multiple, you know, you might have a spline. And, and basically you interpolate between them and you, you intersect the interpolated triangle if that makes sense. I mean... <laughs> okay... Uh, is that vector, mo vector, pa uh, the vector pass and something else? What was okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. For render passes, I guess we'll just sort of support the same, the same things as, uh, as, as Blender internal. Um, roughly, there might be a few things like the diffuse and, and things like that might just be slightly, you know, different. Uh, or, but but uh, the Z buffer, uh, vector pass, those kinds of things should be, we can support them. It's not a problem. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. Actually, it's it's more of a yeah. It, it's not uh, technically. It's not hard to do. It's just the way it's currently working is it it renders whatever you show in the viewport. It's like it shows viewport resolution, viewport layers. But we could add an option to show a render layer in the viewport if you want. Um, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem to add. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, like the particular, the, the exact setup is through, uh, how, it, how it would be done. It's, we can talk about it later, maybe if you just can explain it in more detail. But it's a bit uh, difficult to imagine the, the situation. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Much you can go over time, but I guess I'll just keep taking questions. For uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've did some tests uh, with it. Um, I think it might be fun to add something like that. Um, but you know, I don't, I can't say exactly when we'll do it. Uh, but I, I hope that we can add it sometime in the future. Add some sort of network rendering. Uh, yeah, it has to fit, it fit into GPU memory. Um, it would be interesting to try to find a way to, you know, swap between GPU and CPU memory, just the parts that you need. Um, this is a bit, it doesn't really work that well with progressive rendering because, um, because you're basically looking at the entire image sort of 
each path. And for that, you would probably have to have sort of tiled rendering, and then it will work. Um, so we can, uh, so that's, you know, that it's, it would probably be something you would use more for rendering at the end rather than interactive rendering, but it's something to uh, investigate. Okay, more questions? It would be possible to add something like it. I kind of, I'm not sure if it's all that useful in practice because, um, I mean, you're not going to send, uh, it's, it's not going to be always reliable. If you send something to a render form and it might take like an hour or five hours or 10, it's, it's really hard to predict render times then if you, if you rely on that sort of stopping criterion. Um, so, it could be added, but I'm not sure if you would actually want to use it in practice. Uh, it's just I, it's a guess. I don't know. Now, now in Blender, if you want, you can have my screen image using something instead of something else. Well, I mean, you can actually do the same thing in Cycles. It's more about um, what you render. Like if you render just uh, just point lights and no area lights, then you know it's, it's there's not going to be any noise from that. And if you don't render ambient occlusion, there's not going to be ambient occlusion noise. And if you use only ambient occlusion in cycles, I mean, you can expect it to clean up also after a certain number of samples, just like in Blender. So in that sense, I think it's more of a matter of it, yeah, it's it's a matter of just using just the features that don't add too much noise, I think. Yeah? I don't know how useful it would be in practice. I mean, the cameras, for example, I mean, the camera parameters are matched, so the models should be in the same place. But, uh, you know, you'd be dealing with two sets of materials. You have your cycles materials and your blender materials, so it's, it, it does make it a bit complicated. But I don't see anything sort of stopping you from doing it if you wanted to. You know, you could, um, I don't know how you, yeah. I don't know how useful it would be in practice. I'd have to see. Yeah. Uh, I don't, well, I think that should actually be, even in the Blender internal engine, it's, it can be something that's moved to the compositor, because actually in Blender internal, it's sort of a compositing effect that's built into the render engine. And it could just be as well, it could just as well be a compositing node. So I'd rather not, you know, make, you know, add that kind of thing in the render engine. And if we sort of, we might add it as a compositing node and then you can use that for both Blender internal or other render engines. Okay, more questions? Yeah. It's it's just, well, I mean, if you're impl implementing something on the GPU, there's just like an extra set of limitations that you have, that you have to, and there's sort of, there's often sort of s stupid simple things, like just not being able to pass along pointers just the way that you would like, or just not, not having certain, certain features in the language that you're used to, but, um, I guess mainly, mainly the difficulty uh, was it's just the fact that you cannot allocate anything in the render engine. You can just sort of you have to have everything laid out, and then 
only then you can work on it. I guess it's kind of technical, but um, it's sort of you sort of have to have a separation between you know what what's in the kernel and then some another thing which runs on the CPU, which sort of lays out everything before the kernel can start working, and that's sort of a separation that you uh, have to put into the design to make it work. Yeah. Well, um, basically, I mean, there's sort of different parts to the render API. One is just sort of the API where you just sort of define a render engine and have callbacks for drawing in the viewport, and that is basically on, on par with cycles. The, the only thing that we're sort of cheating and going past that is, um, is there's like five or ten functions or something in between that we're calling directly into Blender, which are not available. But they're not really, we can add them. They're, they're, it's, it, I think it's, it's, I think other render engines could do something very similar. And if they can't do one particular thing, we could fix it. It's not, it's not really a big deal, I think. Uh, okay. Um, no, well, it's not not really being no. I don't I don't really think so. I mean, uh, there's certain optimizations that we could do uh, for the CPU specifically, uh, which I haven't done yet. Um, but we can sort of for those specific parts, we can just add two pieces of code just for those you know, small parts. But um, I don't think there's really any any really major major thing that has to be has to be done differently. I think you can just actually it's sort of the way it's written is is more like trying to do a CPU like thing on a GPU more than other render engines and sort of trying to think about the constraints and trying to do it more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's doing only the ray tracing on the GPU. So if we do things like PVH building, that would be a lot more complicated. Uh, and then you'd probably need to have different implementations or limitations or whatever. Um, but I've sort of not stayed away from those at the moment. Um, and yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, it's just faster if you do it at the object level because it doesn't have to do any shading. You can just sort of skip it immediately, which is a lot faster than sort of starting the shader and figuring it out then, but it can be done. Okay, I guess we'll, we'll stop now because we're already a bit over time.